Kathy and Ruth and all the pastors' wives that have been there uh, just uh, supporting through the background. I also want to thank our media team. I don't think we've mentioned them yet. But uh, so much of what we've done ever since we moved to Corporate Drive, even at uh, Shepherd of the Sierra, media team kept going from building to building, setting up and taking down, and right now uh, they're busy. How do you like our new window we put in? Isn't that nice? I don't know if you noticed, the clouds are actually moving. So I uh, we'll want to thank uh, our media team for all that they do behind the scenes. That makes it possible for us to welcome right now those that are watching both online and on AFTV. And we're so thankful. We have a lot of members of this church who are online members. And we want to greet those. There are people around the world. They don't have a local church they can attend. And uh, they have made this their home. And so we're welcoming them as well. Now, my message will be a little shorter today because we've already had a, a rich time just praising God for the way that He's blessed. Amen? Amen? But I want to talk about how to build a house for God. How do you build a house for God? I remember when I was a kid, uh, my grandmother, who was Jewish, she was driving me some errand through town, and I saw this unique building. And I knew it wasn't a normal building. And I said, Grandma, what's that? She said, that's the synagogue. I said, what's a synagogue? I don't think I could even say it. She said, it's God's house. I thought, whoa. Because I had not been raised very religious, but I knew you know, there was like God. Every now and then my, my grandmother would talk about God, and she'd say, God's going to punish you for this. So I knew there was a God, and I thought, God's house. And that to me seemed so awesome, so fearful. How could there be a place where God would live? How do you build a house for God? It's like we heard in our scripture reading, how do people build a house for God? The heavens of heavens cannot contain him. But the Bible tells us there are several occasions where God instructed his leaders to build him a house that would really be a place for the people to come together. You know, and I thought it would be important to remember that verse in Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to build it. Many, many times along the way in this whole construction process, I've quoted that and said, Lord, unless you build the house, we labor in vain. You have to bless. You have to provide the people and the means and everything for this to come to together. And we want this house to glorify you. Now, there are some nice houses in the world. I, I had to find out because I'm always looking for amazing facts. And I thought, who's got the nicest house in the world? And it's a gentleman that lives in India, a family, Mukesh Ambani. He's got a house there in Mumbai that is 27 stories tall. That's 550 feet high, his house. Four million square feet. How'd you like to dust that? The bottom six floors have 186 parking spaces for the luxury cars. And the 600 plus servants and workers that live in the mansion Got a helipad on the roof, a view of the Arabian Sea and some of the most expensive real estate in one of the busiest cities in India. He's worth, you know, like $45 billion. And so he only spent a measly $2 billion on his home. $2 billion home. There's one floor in the home because it's so hot in Mumbai. It's called the ice room. They have man-made snowflakes. So if you want to cool off, you go to this room where you can have man-made snow blow on you. Got a pool, it's got, you know, anything, ballrooms, bowling hour, theater, just the whole thing. That house is really built for the glory of man. But in the Bible, God said he was going to have Moses build a house that would be a place for him to dwell among them in a special way. So how do you build a house for God? Well, I'm going to give you seven points. won't take too long. And I decided to adopt the letter H to help illustrate this. You build it high, you build it on something hard. You build it holy, happy, hopeful, healing, and then you build it with humans. So let's look at these points. Jesus gives us some scriptures on how to build a house. First of all, he tells us you build it high. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, since moving to this new property, you saw that we went through a pilgrimage of several locations, a home, a couple of schools, uh, some other churches that we borrowed, and the corporate office, and finally settling down in our own place. It's so wonderful. And here we are on top of a hill. And uh, when we met, we thought, you know, we've moved so many places, maybe we ought to clarify the name so they know where we are now. And we thought how appropriate to call it the Hilltop, Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want our light to be on a hill so people will see. And we're wanting to be a light in this community and beyond. Amen? By the way, we have an evangelistic program planned for this October. And it, it starts October 22nd. It's, it's one year after our first meeting. And it goes till November 13th. Panorama of Prophecy. Be praying now that we can reach out locally and beyond. Be a light on the hill. John 12, verse 32, Christ said, If I am lifted up, the reason he says you should put your light on a hill, it's a position of visibility. He said, If I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. You want to be where people can see the light, and then they're drawn. And um, we want to raise that standard of holiness that God has in this church. You must build it on something hard, is the next point. And you know these verses in the Bible. It says in uh, 1 Kings 5, verse 17, And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones and hewn stones, and lay the foundation of the temple. When we went to Israel a couple of years ago, we went down underneath the Wailing Wall, and we got this private tour of one of the foundation stones. And it, I don't know, it must be 25 feet long, it weighs more than a fully loaded 747. Uh, just one stone. You can remember in the Bible when the disciples said to Jesus, let's go look at the stones. I mean, who would do that for fun? But these were monumental stones. It's amazing how they even moved it. They built it on a solid foundation. And as you saw in our video earlier, praise God, we built on the rock. But we know who is that rock. Who is the rock of ages? You want to build your church where you're shining the light of the world, and that is Jesus. You want to build it on the rock of ages, and that is Jesus. And um, rocks, you know, if you don't build on the rock, you know that other verse, Matthew 7, 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That rock is also the word. He that hears these words of mine and does them. Christ is the word. Christ is the light. Christ is the rock. The word is a rock. Ten commandments were written on a rock. It's something solid. I remember reading about a boy who he was vacationing with his family at the beach and he really enjoyed it because he was creative and he finally had a chance to start building some sand castles and he'd do it all day long. His parents would slather him with suntan lotion, he'd go out and he'd spend the day and he'd build castles and then he'd build adjoining houses to them and he'd build virtual cities. But then after a few days of doing this, some rough kids in the afternoon would go up the beach and they saw him building his sandcastle with their bare feet, they kicked it all down. And that was so annoying. Well, the next day he went out again, he started building another castle, and in the afternoon these bullies showed up again, and they kicked it down. And they're laughing at him. He thought that was so mean. Well, he hoped they wouldn't come the third day, but they came the third day, after he had constructed an even better. Every castle was getting better. And they kicked it down. And then he got an idea. Not far from the beach, there was a construction site, and they had some pieces of broken cinder block and stone and brick and rocks. And he went and stacked that where he had been building his castle before, and they were sticking up in the ground, and he just packed some sand around them and started building castles on them. And sure enough, later in the afternoon, those boys started coming up the beach. He went off to the bushes. And he saw them all at the same time, bang and bruise and bloody their toes 
on his castle. They never bothered him anymore after that <laughs> because it was founded on a rock. You want to build it on something high, you want to build it on something hard, and you want to build it holy. The Bible tells us that his house should be a house of prayer for all nations. Isaiah had his converting vision in the temple of God. It says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. And flanking on the right and the left were the seraphim, each with six wings. And they cried out one to another as they covered their face with two wings and their feet with two wings. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Even the angels tell God he is holy. And we want this to be a place where people are relaxed. We want it to be a place where it's practical. We want it to be functional. But let's never lose a sense of reverence. Uh, during Sabbath school, I walked around a little bit and some young people started to run. And I heard the parents say, don't run. Why not? This is a house of God. And I just really appreciate that, that people maintain that there's something different about this building. In our conversation, in our behavior, in our attire, we come and we say, this is where we meet with God. And we want to have a, a sense of reverence. It's a holy place. And uh, a place that doesn't change. You know, when Solomon built the earthly temple, he had all the stones cut off site, perfectly measured, so that when they brought them on site, they would not hear the sound of a hammer as they assembled the building. And uh, he just said, this is going to be like, unlike any other building. And so there was a, a holiness about it. You know, when we built this place, all the workers knew. Uh, even when we got behind schedule, they said, well, you, we, we'd be on schedule, they told us, if you'd let us work Saturdays. We said, no, we'll be off schedule with God. So we're, we're not working Sabbaths. And uh, I think the Lord is going to bless for that. Want to build it holy. You want to build it happy. In Isaiah 56, verse 7, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, I put this here because sometimes people think if you have a holy house, it can't be happy. But no, God says it's supposed to be both. This is to be a place of rejoicing. I even threw in some extra scriptures just so you would not miss it. Ezra 6.16 then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the descendants of the captivity, they celebrated the dedication of the house of God with what? With joy. Friends, we are to be joyful today. We are to be happy at the way that God has blessed and led. Psalm 42, 4. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise. In Luke 24, verse 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Even after Jesus died and ascended to heaven, the apostles continued to go to the house of God and did it with joy, praising God and blessing God. Our Savior's alive. Amen? It's on the right hand in heaven. Someone said, if your religion does not make you happier, then no one is going to want your religion. If your religion makes you sour, no one's going to want your religion. And so we want to be joyful. I heard that Holiday Inn, years ago, were opening a big hotel in a city, and they had to interview. Uh, they needed 50 employees. They actually had 500 people that applied for these jobs in the Holiday Inn. And uh, in the interview process, they had someone that sat with the managers as they interviewed the candidates for these hotel jobs. And they counted how many times people smiled during the interview. If they smiled less than three times, they were automatically out. Because they said, we are in the, um, uh, it's not the hostess business, what? Hospitality. Hospitality business, yeah. And, you know, we're to be friendly. And if they're not friendly, we got the wrong people. Well, friends, we want people to come to our church, right? And so we want to be joyful. We want to be happy. And uh, we, I'm so glad for our greeters that always have a big smile when people come through the door. We want it to be hopeful, a place of faith. Now abides faith, hope, love. And we want this to be a place of hope. 
You know, in the house of God, people came and they prayed and they prayed in faith and great things happened. We remember in the Bible that a publican came to the house of God and he prayed, Lord, have mercy on me. He had faith that God would forgive him even though he was a sinner. You remember where Hannah came to the house of God. She had been barren for years and she prayed in faith and said, Lord, give me a son. And Eli said, God's going to grant you your request. There in the house of God, she believed the word of God and she had a son that became a great leader in Israel. So we wanted to be a place of faith. You can read in 1 Kings 8.33, When your people Israel are defeated from before an enemy, because they've sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and they confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, then hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and bring them back to the land that you gave their fathers. This is to be a house of hope. We also want it to be a place of healing. Of course, the world is sick with sin, and we want people to find spiritual healing in this place. That's first and foremost. All of the physical healing that Jesus did was always secondary to the spiritual healing because the physical healing was temporary. The spiritual healing can potentially be forever. So we want it to be a place of healing, but we also want the physical healing. People came to Christ and they found physical healing. Look at this, Matthew 21, 14. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Peter said there at the temple gates, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his bones and his ankles received strength. So he leaping up, stood, and he walked into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And at that point, probably deacons would say, will you please calm down? But he is walking for the first time. And he came in praising God, walking, leaping, and praising God. We want people to find healing here. Not only we have prayed and had anointing services and seen miracles. It doesn't always happen, but we have seen miracles here where God has blessed people and prolonged their lives and given them healing. But we're also going to be teaching practical health things that people can do to improve their quality of life. And I'll tell you, we sure need that in America. A lot of people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they don't know that it has something to do with the way they're living. And we want to share that truth with people so they can find that healing. Lord, grant that this place can be a house of healing as well. And then finally, we need to build it with humans. You notice in our scripture reading, it said, where's the house that you will build for the Lord? You know, the church is not the building. I am so thankful. You have no idea. I'm so thankful to finally be in here. This has been a vision that has been going on for 20 years. I'm not exaggerating. From the time of concept that we needed to do something at Central and build a church, and I had no idea. If I knew how much was involved, God didn't want me to know. Because if I knew, I would have said, Lord, I'm not your man. But uh, I am so thankful for the building. I'm so thankful we'll, we'll be able to do so much, so many practical things in ministry. And uh, I really praise the Lord, but I have no illusions. This is not the church. It's not two by fours in metal. You are the church. It is people. We were reminded several times during the pandemic that even when we couldn't get under the roof, we still had a church. It's the people. Now, I think it's important for us to come together. We have scriptures on that. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And Jesus said, and when you come together, it's assumed that we will gather together. And the Holy Spirit was poured out, and they were of one accord in one place. We want the outpouring of the Spirit, right? Sometimes God uses these places, but ultimately the Bible says that you are the church. Let me read you some verses. Ephesians 2.19 now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What is our foundation? Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitly joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
Someone said, the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. We do not exist solely for our benefit. We exist principally for the benefit of those that are not here, that we might reach them with the gospel. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And I like this one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, Coming to him as a living stone, Jesus, our cornerstone, rejected indeed of men, but chosen by God and precious, like the precious stones that Solomon used. You also, living stones, are built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. He who believes on him will by no means put, be put to shame. We have nothing to worry about if we believe in Jesus. You know, they got these interesting uh, practices among the Mennonites, the Amish. Sometimes they need to relocate a house or a barn and it's amazing what they do. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the video footage of this. This is one that I just captured online where they needed to relocate one gentleman's barn and so instead of hiring a construction company they got 200 men. The women all come and they cook the food and the men all get together and they build struts and straps and they put it underneath the barn and they get instructions and when they call out the signals, I think it's in some German they lift the barn and they move the barn. It's just an amazing thing to see. <laughs> they say, oh, two steps right, two steps left, a little slowly up, down. It's amazing. They moved the barn 100 yards. The men did it manually by working together. You know, they've got these ants that are spreading everywhere. They're called fire ants. And they were introduced from South America. But boy, they can't stop them. And the interesting thing about these ants, one reason the... Uh, uh, entomologists, who is it that studies bugs? I forget. Bug scientists. Yeah. They say they're so successful in spreading is because they are a living structure. When they come to a place that's too high, they turn themselves into a ladder. When they come to a place that is too far, they turn themselves into a bridge. They stretch apart across, they link their arms together, and then they let the others walk across them. When they come to a river, they make themselves into a boat. And some of them will drown in the process, but they will keep the others alive. And when they camp for the night, they turn themselves into a building. And with all the babies protected inside, they are like a living organism. And that's, I think, a kind of a beautiful illustration. I don't want you to be fire ants, but I'll tell you, they're getting out there. Nothing can stop them because they work together and there's a lesson there for us to learn. Amen? Amen? So we want this church to be a church that is going to be built on Christ. Built on something hard, high, holy, happy, hopeful healing with humans. I remember hearing a story years ago about this uh, Navy battleship that was doing some maneuvers in the Atlantic Ocean one stormy night. And uh, in the process, because the weather was so rough, the captain was up on the bridge and, and uh, one of the lookouts said, there's another ship directly off the, uh, the bow. And the captain said, well, we can't break radio silence, so use the, uh, they got these flashing lights, they flash Morse code. He said, tell him he needs to adjust his course 20 degrees. So they sent the signal with their flashing Morse code and they said, uh, signal light, yeah, adjust your course 20 degrees. And back came the response, you adjust your course 20 degrees west. The captain thought, well, what does he think? He's not the captain. He said, you tell him that I am a captain. I want him to adjust his course 20 degrees east. They sent the signal. Back came the signal. He said, I am a seaman second class. Adjust your course 20 degrees west. Now the captain was really upset. He said, Send him back a signal and say, we are a battleship. Adjust your course 20 degrees east. And back came the signal that said, I'm the lighthouse on a rock. Adjust your course 20 degrees <laughs> west. Jesus is the rock. 
We need to order our lives with Him and His Word. Amen? We want this church to be an immovable lighthouse in the community that Christ can use. How many of you feel the same way? Amen. We're going to sing about it, that Jesus is our cornerstone. He is our lighthouse. Let's stand together. It's 348 in your hymnals. It'll also, I believe, be on the screen. The church has one foundation. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you and praise you. We give you glory and, and praise for what you have done. And, and uh, we just, it, it's hard to comprehend the miracles that you perform and the way you provided to provide this place. We thank you for the people that you have provided to fill it, the people that you provided uh, to work and to serve with the, the children and the music and the greeting and the kitchen and so many other, other departments, Lord. And we just thank you. Help us, Lord, to share the gospel with this perishing world, the good news about Jesus. I pray that you'll protect us, that we might live lives that will please you, and that we can grow in holiness to be more and more like our Savior. Thank you, Lord. We consecrate this building to you, but even more, we consecrate ourselves, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Three parting announcements. One is... If you're interested in being a member of this church and you're not, 
Come talk to the pastors or the greeters at the door. We'd love to have you be part of the family. Two, don't forget to give the cards with your vision for the church. There'll be a basket for that in the foyer. We want you to leave those so we can put them in the time capsule and, and uh, maybe dig that up someday. Three, please remember that the uh, ushers and deacons will be at the doors to receive your